Digital audio has revolutionized the way we produce music. The noise floor is so low that we can basically ignore it, there's more headroom than we could ever possibly need, and it exhibits totally linear, distortion-free behavior. Compared to analog, digital audio is higher fidelity in every way imaginable. But if this is the case, then why do so many engineers and producers today still use analog gear? And why do companies like the sponsor of this video, Universal Audio, continue to produce analog gear like the 1176 and the LA-2A, as well as plug-in emulations of analog consoles, compressors, and tape machines? If we're going to answer this question, it's important that we first agree that there's a difference between higher fidelity and better. Fidelity means the degree of exactness with which something is copied and reproduced, while better means better. This is important because the secret behind analog being better, in many cases, can mostly be boiled down to the fact that it's not as high fidelity as digital audio. If you want a low noise, clean, and distortion-free recording that faithfully represents the input signal being recorded, digital is the way to go. Before digital audio was widely used in studios, the primary goal of most engineers was to make clean recordings with minimal noise and minimal distortion. But realizing this goal with analog gear came with a few big challenges. For instance, take the behavior of an analog tape machine. If levels were set too low, the signal would be buried within the noise floor, and if levels were set too high, the signal would be distorted. Digital technology allowed engineers to realize the goal of a clean recording to a level that was simply unimaginable with analog tape. But when they finally had access to such a perfect tool, many of them realized that greater fidelity didn't necessarily correlate to better sound. Throughout the decades of producing music with analog equipment, engineers and listeners had developed a familiarity and even an emotional connection with the imperfections of analog gear. The sound of music itself had become intertwined with the idiosyncrasies of the analog equipment used to make it. So when digital audio removed all of those imperfections, the music was left sounding sterile and lifeless. And audio engineers quickly learned that while it's easy to end up with too much distortion when using analog, it's just as easy to end up with too little distortion when using digital. And that's the main reason why we spend so much time today trying to put that distortion or analog magic back into our digital productions. Let's take a closer look at what actually happens when you pass a signal through analog gear and try to figure out what makes analog analog. With the EQ on this UA precision channel strip, the input signal level doesn't matter. Increasing the input signal level by 12 dB will just result in an equal increase to the output signal level. Regardless of the input level going into this EQ plugin, the EQ cut applied to the signal will also remain the same. This is true all the way up to the point where the input or output signal level exceeds 0 dB full scale in a fixed point digital audio system. But so long as we stay below 0 dB, the behavior is perfectly linear. In fact, many modern DAWs operate internally with floating point, which means that they maintain linearity even far beyond 0 dB full scale. One of the signature characteristics of analog gear is that it has a non-linear response to input levels. Typically, analog gear is designed for a somewhat linear response at its intended operating level, but no analog circuit has unlimited headroom. And at a certain point, boosting the input signal by 12 dB will result in very audible distortion. To hear this, just listen to what happens when I send a relatively low signal level into this analog tape machine or in this case, an emulation of a tape machine by Universal Audio, and then slowly increase the input level. As you can hear, overloading the input of a tape machine or saturating magnetic tape while recording wasn't always a bad thing, even though it ultimately resulted in signal distortion. On the other hand, overloading the input of a digital system will almost always sound terrible because it results in digital clipping that very closely resembles a square wave. You've undoubtedly heard this when your mic input levels exceed 0 dB in your DAW during a recording session. 
But what is actually happening to the signals when the limits of each system are approached and exceeded? To demonstrate this, first I'll send a 100 Hz sine wave out of my audio interface and back into the input. We can see on the frequency analyzer that there's a spike of energy at 100 Hz, but nowhere else. This is true all the way up to 0 dB full scale. If the signal level exceeds 0 dB FS by even 0 0.01 dB, we start to see some significant harmonic distortion. All the way up to that point, the level of the sine wave just increases. But at the point where the signal actually exceeds the limit, we see a few additional frequencies arise. And these frequencies are called harmonics. The same is true the other way around. Now I'll send a 100 Hz sine wave out of the interface, never exceeding 0 dB full scale on the output, but I'll increase the preamp gain to the point where the signal level begins to exceed 0 dB full scale on the input. Again, we see some significant harmonics pop up at that exact moment. And as that signal is driven further into clipping, more harmonics are created, and the level of those harmonics increases relative to the fundamental frequency. We would see a similar outcome if we sent this signal through a tape machine. But instead of getting a clean sound until we hit the absolute limit, we start seeing harmonics even before that point. And the relative levels of each harmonic frequency are a bit different too. These harmonics don't just pop up in the electrical domain either. They can also occur naturally in acoustics. For example, playing a note A on a guitar with the fundamental frequency of 220 hertz won't merely result in energy at the fundamental, but will also excite some harmonic frequencies. In all three of these cases, digital clipping, analog tape distortion, and playing a note on an acoustic instrument, the harmonics that arise follow a similar pattern. The harmonic series is found by adding the fundamental frequency to itself again and again. In our initial examples, 100 Hz was the fundamental frequency, the second harmonic was 200 Hz, the third harmonic was 300 Hz, the fourth harmonic was 400 Hz, and so on. Generally speaking, even order harmonics tend to sound sweeter to our ears compared to odd order harmonics. However, they can both certainly sound great in a mix. What's most important is the relative blend of each harmonic frequency within this series, and that's a big part of what gives each unique instrument or electrical circuit its own character. Analog harmonic distortion tends to follow a pattern that more closely resembles the harmonic frequencies that unfold from a musical instrument. Hence, this type of harmonic distortion seems to sound more musical. Meanwhile, the series of harmonics generated by digital distortion is generally less musical. But again, they both have a place in a great sounding mix. To visualize why these harmonics pop up when you saturate or distort a signal, consider what happens when you layer several odd order harmonic frequencies together and then combine them into one waveform. You get something that approximates a square wave. This goes both ways. If we chop off the top of this sine wave, we see that it's now made up of harmonic components. This is similar to what happens when you drive a sine wave beyond the limits of a circuit. The top of the wave is flattened out, which results in higher frequency components. Similarly, we can create triangle waves, sawtooth waves, square waves, or anything in between by simply adjusting the balance of even and odd harmonic frequencies. And we don't necessarily need a dedicated distortion or saturation effect in order to create harmonic distortion in our mix. We can also use a compressor or a limiter to achieve this effect. When we use a digital compressor, we'll usually get odd order harmonics. That's what we see when using the Precision Channel Strip Compressor plugin. But when using an analog compressor or plugin emulation of one, we'll also see some even order harmonics in the mix. The Universal Audio Volt 276 audio interface has a built-in analog 1176 style compressor. As you can see here, we get a ton of richness when exceeding the threshold of this compressor. A similar behavior can be observed when running a signal through this 1176 emulation. So not only do these compressors keep the dynamic range of the signal in check, but they also excite harmonics, which can sound very pleasing to the ear and can contribute to better cohesion within an overall mix. Compression has a big role in the mixing process, but harmonic distortion can be used in more subtle ways too. Let's compare the linear precision channel strip EQ to this Universal Audio Pultec MEQ5 emulation. On the linear analysis, we can match up the frequency response of each plugin by adjusting the gain, frequency, and Q settings. So far, they look identical. 
but let's take a look at the harmonic analysis. Even if we reset the settings on both EQs, we can see that harmonic frequencies are excited just by simply running a signal through the pull tech. And the balance of those harmonics changes as we drive the input of the pull tech harder. While we never see any audible harmonic distortion with the precision channel strip EQ. The precision channel strip EQ remains linear no matter what we do to the settings, making it perfect for fine-tuned surgical adjustments. But this data tells me that the pull tech might be better when we want to add some character to the signal. These results are even more interesting if we represent this information in a different way. Instead of just sending one sine wave to these plugins, what would happen if we sent a broadband signal with energy across the frequency spectrum? This is the Hammerstein tab within Plugin Doctor, and it gives us an idea of the effects that can be expected at the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh order harmonics at varying input frequencies. Right now, you can see that the precision channel strip EQ only shows information at the first harmonic, the fundamental frequency. Adjusting the gain structure at any point won't impact the harmonic content generated because there isn't any audible harmonic distortion associated with this very clean digital EQ. Running this test on the Pultec MEQ5 tells an entirely different story though. Again, we see harmonic content across the frequency spectrum before even adjusting the settings on the EQ. And when we start to adjust the levels, we see various patterns of harmonic content arise. Most of the magic we experience with analog audio gear is due to this harmonic distortion, but it's still just one reason why engineers around the world continue to use analog gear. In the next video, we'll take a look at a few additional reasons why analog compressors and limiters are still a staple in the modern music production workflow.